it's getting close to lunch and everybody's a little fried. So I'm just going to try to do a 30,000 foot view of what we are trying to accomplish at the Ivy Center. The Ivy Center is a, a, a translational research laboratory here uh, and clinical facility where we try to do um, work that directly can be applied to patients. So a lot of our work is uh, not as basic and more translational oriented. Um, but just as a reminder, the, um, the overall uh, advances in GBM uh, therapies have been very poor uh, compared, especially to something like lung cancer, as you can see in this slide. Um, and when I try to conceptualize what the main problems are for GBM moving forward, we're dealing with something that's a very heterogeneous tumor genetically and cellular wise. Uh, GBMs don't have as many characteristics mutations. Um, Dr. Shrek mentioned in low-grade gliomas, there are you know, certain mutations that you can focus on, but it's not quite as often in GBMs that you'll find these driver mutations that can be drugged. Uh, and then um, you know, we have one drug, basically, a one, one, uh, one drug that works in about two thirds of our patients or, you know, the, uh, actually probably about a third of the patients with GBM that are um, methylated for MGMT. So we really have a one, one drug challenge that we need to overcome. And then the biggest uh, problem I think with the um, change in the environment of all of cancer therapy related to immunotherapy is we're dealing with a tumor that has a low um, immunological, um, uh, sort of a tumor suppressor microenvironment as, as Dr. Heath and Dr. Lim have outlined. Um, this is just a, uh, a slide to show that the targeted therapies so far have been disappointing. And, you know, obviously the BRAF uh, focus, which we just heard about is great if that's um, present, but in GBM, as we know, only a small percentage of tumors can be targeted with, with driver mutations. And this slide outlines um, sort of the thinking that uh, indicates why the um, why GBMs have not responded to checkpoint inhibitors. Because if you look at the mutation burden, for instance, of melanoma and lung cancer on this um, scale that uh, that shows they have tenfold as many mutations basically as GBM, and so just by in increasing T cell function by checkpoint inhibitors, you can get an anti tumor response in them, which you don't typically see in GBM. So, in GBM, what we're dealing with, sorry, this, and this is just a slide to show that in those tumors like melanoma and lung cancer, you get so many mutations that you'll get altered um, uh, protein, proteins expressed that are sort of neo, tumor neoantigens. And when these are presented to T cells in the presence of a checkpoint inhibitor, you can have an overall tumor response without any specific tumor uh, antigen per se. Um, however, in GBM, as we know that the tumors are, um, are cold, as Dr. Heath mentioned, as Jim Heath mentioned, and they're um, covered with um, monocyte derived, amyloid derived suppressor cells, both macrophages uh, and other types of mononuclear cells and poly polymorphonuclear cells. Uh, so that even in the presence of checkpoint inhibitors to PD-1 and CTLA-4, these tumors um, do, not, um, do not respond to the immunotherapy quite as well. And so from this sort of generalized perspective, I think the goal is to figure out, are there any ways we can enhance or identify targets on these tumors um, that we can train the immune system to attack? A and B, can we increase the heat of the tumors? And it's going to be touching on what Dr. Heath was mentioning to make them a hotter, more immuno um, visible tumor. So the first thing I'm going to mention is just in terms of these uh, obstacles that I mentioned, um, we are trying to go after all of them in the um, IV center in different ways. Uh, the genetic heterogeneity and low response to, to one drug uh, Dr. Harvey Hoti mentioned in her talk, and I'm going to briefly mention that. The problem is there are very few specific tumor-associated uh, uh, antigens in GBM. We're going to um, 
I'm going to discuss. And then uh, at the end, I'm going to talk about, you know, what we're doing to try to overcome this immunosuppressed microenvironment that makes them cold tumors. So first of all, I'm not going to belabor this because this was Dr. Hothi's talk, but um, instead of trying to uh, alter or improve the effects of temozolomide, my predecessor, Greg Fultz and Dr. Hoti decided, let's take a shotgun approach, um, narrow down uh, high throughput screens to um, 76 FDA um, approved drugs that have the ability to cross the blood brain barrier, uh, screen individual pac patients on cancer stem cells and come up with a, a top 10 of those patients and then pick three of those drugs that can be given in combination. And as mentioned, we've, we've uh, completed nine out of 10 of these patient treatments for the phase one study with no significant adverse effects. And we're planning to move to a phase one study in upfront GBM, which may have a dramatically more uh, greater impact given the fact that just radiation and temozolomide may alter a tumor cell's response to any given drug. Um, and what's probably the most exciting for me is uh, we're now working, as she mentioned, with the Institute for Systems Biology um, to do um, sort of rational understanding of uh, categories of GBMs that may respond to a certain drug. For instance, there's a certain statin that some of them seem to respond to. And when you give this statin to the, these GBMs that are responsive, they all sort of um, go in a different direction. And uh, we're trying to figure out if we can figure out the um, signaling pathways that you could target to block that sort of uh, ability of the tumors to escape the statin drug so that eventually we can come up with rational drug design based on um, screening of tumor cells and come up with a rational cocktail. Because I believe no matter what we do, the treatment of GBM is going to take multi-drug or multi-therapy um, uh, approach. So the second thing we're working on is tumor antigens or what can we train the immune system to attack? Um, years ago, my group, when I was at University of Alabama, um, hypothesized that there may be a viral association. And um, this has led to years and years of basic controversy about whether or not cytomegalovirus antigens are present in glioblastoma. Um, we were pretty convinced that CMB was present. We had evidence of PCR and sequencing. Um, from GBMs and multiple monoclonal antibodies to CMB seem to be present in GBM and a high percentage of them. Um, other labs like this group in Norway also found that they could identify these similar CMB antigens and GBMs and also that the T cells in those GBMs that were CMB specific were exhausted T cells and non-functional um, and they had high levels of um, in checkpoint inhibitors associated with them. So um, despite this fact, um, early on, my colleagues at Duke and I got together and they decided to do clinical trials to vaccinate with dendritic cells, uh, GBM patients with one of the predominant antigens that, um, that the immune system sees for CMV, which is PP65, uh, and really in a dramatic series of now three phase one studies, they have shown in um, probably a total of about 30 patients that the median survival of those patients that got the dendritic cell vaccine to the CMV PP65 antigen uh, has been somewhere in the um, area of um, you know, 30 months or greater. And there are some of these patients that have lived uh, out beyond 10 years in, in some of these studies with uh, really dramatic results. And they published um, the last study in um, clinical cancer research with the title Long-Term Survival in GBM with CMV PP65 vaccination. Um, I will be the first to confess my lab still has difficulty understanding what's going on, whether this is actually bona fide CMV or maybe some type of um, similar virus with similar antigens or could it be off target effects? <clears throat> so we're currently doing experiments and I won't go into the details to try to uh, isolate and perform mass spec and protein sequencing on these antigens that we see not only in glioblastoma but in multiple other tumor types that appear to be CMV antigens. 
Um, and then there's this uh, other concept that was no, first told to me by one of my colleagues who has been doing adoptive T-cell immunotherapy for glioblastoma using CMV specific T-cells in um, Australia. And he said he thinks there are off target effects that CMV, uh, tar that antigens, that, excuse me, T-cells targeting CMV may have really um, off target anti-tumor effects. And this is a paper that came out in the last year, which shows that this, the peptide for this antigen that the Duke group is vaccinating with is ex almost identical to one of the um, melanoma uh, associated, tumor associated antigens. And when patients with melanoma have a CMV infection, they have improved survival, suggesting that the immune response to CMV may not only um, have a CMV specific effect, but have an anti-tumor effect. So we're kind of trying to entertain all possibilities of what's going on here. And we're trying to isolate these proteins and figure out exactly what they are, because it seems like despite our confusion that something may be going on clinically in the clinical trial setting. Um, another very exciting project that um, Dr. Karimi in my lab initiated was, is associated with the concept of alternative splicing. So we all know that DNA encodes for RNA with introns and exons and that uh, processed RNA involves putting together introns, excuse me, exons. So for instance, this RNA will encode for this protein with A, B, and D, whereas if you have an alternative splice event where uh, this um, exon is added in, then this protein will actually have an additional bit of uh, protein, which if it's tumor specific, could be a tumor specific antigen. So we hypothesized that this may be going on in glioblastoma. And we looked back through multiple, uh, multiple RNA seq uh, databases and um, we found 103 genes that were associated with alternative splicing and uh, associated with disease progression in GBM. 58 of those were, <clears throat> and we selected 21 of those to look at with um, uh, Western blotting to see if they were altered. And just to cut to the chase, we found that uh, in many cases we had, um, sorry, I have to move something around my screen. We had, um, we could see that in normal compared to tumor, there were alternative splicing events that made the protein have different size. And in this case, on, in five out of the six GBMs that we compared to normals, there were these upper bands that were not seen in GBM, sort of confirming that there may be tumor associated uh, spliced proteins that were not seen in the normal tissues. Um, the next thing we did was excuse me, to go uh, into our own archives where I've often taken normal tumor and adjacent GBM. If I have to go to a deep GBM, I will take out the tumor, the normal tissue overlying the uh, tumor. And we've done um, in collaboration with the Institute for Systems Biology and now with folks at Ohio State, we've done huge uh, mass spectrometry uh, studies where um, by taking three pa pairs of matched tumor and normal tumor and normal, we um, have looked at about 500,000 peptides covering about 6,000 proteins. And of these, we found about 400 that seem to be alternatively spliced consistently in the GBMs compared to the normals of the three different patients. And a brilliant student in our lab, um, George Sun has developed a software a pipeline that allows us to compare the tumor, which are shown here in red and the matching blue being the um, normal uh, for all of these peptides and an algorithm that can, can identify uh, highly expressed uh, peptides that are seen only in the tumor, but not in the adjacent normal. And we're expanding this to more cases now, but um, to cut to the chase, we see that uh, some proteins which are spliced alternatively or maybe not even spliced alternatively or only expressed in the tumor, but not the normal like HMOX1. And then this protein, for instance, MSI2, we see it in tumor, but not the normal tumor, not in the normal, these peptides here. And uh, when we go back and compare tumor and normal Western blots, we see that the tumor typically has an altered version of the protein not seen in normal. And so what we hope to do is expand these studies to find more and more targets. And then um, the real goal will be to find targets that are 
expressed on the cell surface that may be amenable to approaching with uh, antibodies or CAR T therapy. And um, as you probably know, the, the concept of a CAR T therapy is to take, for instance, a T cell receptor that is specific for one of these, let's say we identify uh, 20 novel epitopes that are tumor associated, we can make T cell receptors that are specific to those peptides. We can, trans, uh, we can put them into, um, we can genetically express them into a T cell receptor into a CAR T so that that uh, CAR T cell will be trained and uh, specific to that specific peptide expressed on the tumor cell. Uh, and hopefully if it's not expressed on other cells in the body or in the normal brain, then we will have a, um, a bunch of tumor associated antigen CAR T cells that we can uh, work with for patients so that you could potentially take out a tumor, do mass spec, find which protein or epitopes they have, and then come up with a cocktail of CAR T cells specific to that patient's tumor. That's far-fetched, but we're working on a grant right now with a group that's a CAR T expert to try to um, come up with a strategy to do this. So um, the last thing I'll mention, which uh, Dr. Heath talked about already, was that um, we know glioblastomas are cold tumors. And the studies he did that were published uh, recently that he described by looking at areas of uh, GBMs where you see infiltrating T cells in the presence of PD-1 inhibition versus no infiltrating T cells and uh, look at specific proteins that are expressed in those areas, he was able to identify proteins that are associated with a poor T cell infiltration, most notably B7H3. And as he mentioned, B7H3 is an antigen uh, normally not expressed on cells, but in tumors, it's often expressed on the cell surface and it's immunosuppressive and it's, uh, it promotes uh, tumor uh, proliferation, invasion, migration. And um, so as he mentioned, our goal is to take this basic science information and work with a company that we were speaking to this morning, Macrogenics, who has um, inhibitory antibody to this B7H3 and maybe move that forward in collaboration with ISB and the group at UCLA to try to see what happens if we block the uh, B7H3 antigen in, this, in the setting of a PD-1 um, checkpoint inhibitor to see if we can increase the ability of T cells to infiltrate and kill tumor cells. So uh, a, lot, a lot of things we covered, but uh, basically we're trying to go in a multi-pronged uh, approach to overcome some of these major uh, thematic obstacles that uh, we see in glioblastoma, and it kind of summarizes what the group here is doing at the Ivy Lab. Thank you very much.